The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. The eleven disciples set out for Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had arranged to meet them. And when they saw him, they fell down before him, though some hesitated. And Jesus came up and spoke to them. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teach them to observe all commandments that I give you. And know that I am with you always. Yes, to the end of the time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Today we celebrate the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity. Well, this has confused many, many, many a theologian. So I'm going to try my best today not to confuse you, okay? Because the, the mystery is precisely that. It is a mystery. And, and a mystery is not something that you can solve. It's not a riddle. A riddle is something you're supposed to solve. A mystery is something you enter into. And as you enter into the mystery, you, you start to see both its beauty and its complexity. But you also start to see the way that God is revealing himself to us through this mystery, drawing us closer to, to God. What I want to say to start is, let, let's get the parameters really straight and clear. In our first reading, we see Moses speaking to the people in the book of Deuteronomy. And, and, and he's putting this question to them. And putting the question to the ages that are past. The ages that went before you. From the time that God created the earth, was there ever a word so majestic from one end of heaven to the other? Was anything ever heard? Did ever, any people ever hear the voice of God speaking to them from the heart of the fire? As you heard it and remain alive? Has God ever ventured to take one nation and bring that nation to himself and defend that nation ever, anywhere in the world? What, what Moses is saying to the people is that what we know about God comes from revelation. From nature, we can know that there is something that is beyond us. From nature, we can discern that there is more than, than, than what we see and what, what the eyes, the hands, the senses and the, can, can perceive. From nature we can know that. But we can't know the, the, the characteristic of this, of this being except through the revelation that we, that we have had. So, so for instance, you, we know that there is something called a Big Bang from science. We know that. And, and many scientists have railed against it. In fact, one of the, the greatest of our scientists, scientific minds, Stephen Hawkins, proposed when he was starting his, his theory of time, he proposed that everything always was. And he walked down that road for a long time until he realized that the universe is expanding. And it is expanding in a particular rate. It, it is a fixed rate of expansion. And no matter where he went in the universe, he realized that it's expanding at the same rate. And when he realized that, he also realized something more fundamental than that. If it is expanding, it means it came from, from a, a, a moment when it was not. And he traced that expansion all the way back to what we now call the Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, there was no space, there was no time, there was no matter. So what was there before the Big Bang? What was there? And, and if there was no space, no time, no matter before the Big Bang, how did space, time, and matter come into being? It was caused into being. And, and, and what was the cause that, that brought all of this into being? And that's where the questions of science come into the questions of theology. And, and we will say it was God who brought everything into being. And then you go to the Genesis story and you see, in the beginning, there was a formless void. 
and God's Spirit hovered over it, and God said. So from the very first chapter of the book of Genesis, we have already met God, the Spirit who hovers, the Word that is spoken. St. John will come in, in his gospel and say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word that was spoken over the formless void was God. So why is it not three gods then? Father, Son, and Spirit. Why is this not three gods? Well, that's where Moses comes in. And that's where this first reading comes in. Because it's holding something that is very, very important. I put this question to the ages past that have gone before you. Was there ever a God, a word so majestic from one end of the, of the heavens to other? God created man on earth. Did ever, ever people ever hear the voice of the living God? The, the, the reading that we have is not only speaking to the fact that the creation was put into motion by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it is saying that God sustains the world as it is right now. And not only does God sustain the world, God has taken a preferential love for a people called Israel. And, and in this preferential love for this people called Israel, God is revealing God's self to this people. And through this revelation, is showing this people what true love really is. And that's why Moses is comparing the experience of the people who were brought out of Egypt by God. And, and were br being brought to the promised land by God. And who were being fed every day by God and governed every day by God. He's comparing their experience to all the ages past. And there never has been a people who have experienced such a thing as this. And, and therefore, Moses is, is, is working with this notion that there is only one God. You see, what the people were doing when Moses went up the, the mountain and he was receiving the Ten Commandments, he took a little bit long, and so they hesitated. And in their hesitation, they went to Aaron and they said to Aaron, come, let us do sacrifices to the gods because, you know, we know what Moses is doing. And they took all their earrings, their gold, their silver, everything, and they made a molten calf. And they forged gods in their own image and likeness. They, they, they created gods out of their own hands. And, and that's because the nations around believed that there were many gods. So the Greek pantheon was filled with all kinds of gods. And the confusion on earth is, is because all these gods are fighting. And, and Moses is moving these people, or God is moving these people through Moses, from the understanding that there are many gods to the understanding that there is only one God. You see, in the beginning, they, they believed that, that their God, Yahweh, was the biggest and the baddest of all the gods. So there were many gods, but, 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 but they, had, they had a winning team. You, you know any little boy in school say, my daddy bigger and bad, badder than yours? Well, well, that's how Israel was. My God bigger and badder than yours, and, and, and that's why we will triumph, because our God is bigger and badder than yours. And Moses is saying, no, 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 no. There is only one God. There, there's not a multiplicity of gods. There is only one God. And this God is revealed and in the revelation of this God what what we come to see is something that that is that is quite amazing because in the in the revelation of this God we have we have a, a sense of, of of this God as Father Son and Holy Spirit if we listen to our psalm it says by his word the heavens were made by the breath of his mouth all the stars he spoke and they came to be he commanded they sprang into being. And there we have a revelation of the Trinity again in the Psalms. By his word, we know the word became flesh. The heavens were made by the breath. And if you remember Pentecost, the, the whole room was filled with the breath. The same word here, ruah, which is, which is wind or spirit or breath. The, the, that filled the room in Pentecost and, and, and breathed the Spirit into them is the same word that is being used about the breath that brings about the stars. And, and so we have, we have God, the Father, the word that is spoken, the breath that animates and brings into motion 
all that there is. In, in this, what we see is, is the Old Testament coming to partial understanding, to real partial understanding of God. And, and, and in the partial understanding, it is being purified and purified and purified as it goes along until Israel eventually comes to the notion that there is only one God. That the, that the gods of the heathens are naught. They are naught. If, if you remember Elijah upon, upon the mountain with the, with the false prophets or the prophets of the false god, the Baals, and, and, and the, when he said to them, you, you set up a cow and pray to God to light the fire. And, and then he, he said, you know, help me a little bit. There's only one of me. Bring water and, and douse my, my cow. But yeah, put more water on the thing. That my, oh, God, man, I tell all you, I want water. Put, I want the thing wet. Wet it. And then he says a simple prayer. And fire emerges. That, that, that this God is not one among many. This God is the only God. You know, in the, in the ancient days, they, they, they had this idea of, of creating all these shrines to all these gods. We look back at that and we say, but, but they, they were crazy, you know. Well, were they? Are we any different? When we, when we put making money before our devotion to God, what are we doing there? That too is idolatry, you know. That's idolatry. When, when we are too busy to pray on a daily basis, what, what are we doing there? Remind me now, I forgot, I forgot, oh gosh. What are we doing there? That too is idolatry. When, when we don't have time, the we can make a Sunday, a Sunday mass on a regular basis. What are we doing there? We, we are putting other things before God, and therefore we are forgetting the first commandment. The Lord your God is one. You shall have no other gods before me. When, when we put our family or our spouse or, or anyone before God, what are we doing? What are we doing? We're not erecting shrines and, 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 and building monuments as the ancients did, but we're still going into idolatry. If, if we believe that God is one, then we also must believe that, that this God is the only God. And, and our, all of our being must give ref, reverence to this God. And, and, and what I'm trying to show is how through the history of the, New Test, of the old into the new, how this notion of God has emerged and how the human mind has struggled and struggled to come to understand this God. And how today we too struggle to come to understand this God. Paul says everyone moved by the Spirit is a son of God. Wow. Wow. Everyone moved by the Spirit. So he's talking about the Spirit. He's talking about the Son. But if there's a Son, you can't have a Son without having a, a Father. So, so Paul is already speaking in a Trinitarian language. Everyone moved by the Spirit is a son of God. Why? Because the Son, through the cross, has adopted you and me. And through baptism, we have become members of his body. And because we've been joined into his body through baptism, where we were overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, we have become part of his body and adopted as his children in his kingdom. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he says, and it is the Spirit that makes us cry out, Abba, Father. That, that it is not just that there is a God who created everything, brothers and sisters. It's not just that this God was, 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 was the biggest and the baddest God. This God is Father. And, and this is the primary relationship that we have. This God is Father. This God is Son in whom we are incorporated through the actions of this Holy Spirit. And this Spirit teaches us to cry out and recognize and to see and to believe and to live that this God is Father. A loving Father who takes care of His children. That is different. So what is the, the doctrine of the Trinity? 
It, it is the central doctrine of the whole of Christianity. There is no doctrine that is more important than this or, or takes precedence over this one. Everything else is hinged on this. If we go to the Incarnation, if we go to the, any, any, the Eucharist is hinged on this. Every other doctrine participates in this mystery. And what is it? Is that God is one, but God is three persons. God is one God, but God is three persons. We're not worshiping three gods. We're worshiping one God, three persons. Why? Well, that is, that is a million dollar question, you know. And, and, and here's my best at it. If we really believe that God is love, love always flows outside of itself to the other. To love is to give yourself to another. To love is to give yourself to another. And, and how could God be love if God is one person? Who, who, what is the object of God's love if God is one person? If God is one person, then the, the creation becomes necessary. Because God would have to flow the love to somewhere. And that would have to be the creation. And, and what we know is God subsists in God's self. That the God needs nothing outside of God's self. God, God's creating of the, of the whole cosmos is not because God had a need to love. And therefore needed an object of that love. God creates the cosmos out of the overflow of love. Not because of a need, because God subsists in God's self and has no need outside of God's self. But God's love flows out from self, from the three persons, out to the Trinity. And that's why Jesus would say, everything, everything I have comes from the Father. And all I have, I give to the Spirit. You, you see how it works? That, that ne none of the three are holding anything to, to themselves. That, that isn't, isn't that exactly just between me and you, man. Don't, don't tell nobody this, but isn't that exactly how, how you spouses work? Everything you have is given to your spouse. Everything you have and, and, and everything they have is given to you and to the children and none of you hold anything to yourself whatsoever. Come on, man. Talk to me now. Isn't, isn't that? Because that's the definition of love. Holding nothing for you and giving everything you have to others everything and, and that's what why god is trinity because the father gives everything to the son and the spirit the son gives everything to the spirit and and, and the father the, and, and, and 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 this is the dynamism of the trinity it, it is a love that that gives all to the other and holds nothing to the self and in this dynamism it is a force of love that is more powerful than any nuclear reaction that could ever happen on earth. It, it is a force that is so powerful, it is so potent, it, it, it is so real that, that, that this force of love that, that, is, that is in the heart of the Trinity that is eternal explodes not because of need but it explodes because of, 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 of love that, that is flowing out to the other that's what we call the Big Bang at the beginning it was love that caused the whole thing into motion in the beginning and I, I wanted to hear from from Matthew's gospel because this this now is, is our response to the Trinity and, 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 and if there is love that is so real Love requires a response. And, 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 and the whole drama of human history is the drama of our poor response to the incredible love of God. And, and that's the real drama. Our poor response to the incredible love of God. That, that God's love is, 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 is so dynamic. It's, it's so potent. It's so real. It's so rich. It, it, it is so amazing. And, and, and what we do is, is we, we, play, we play this game of hard to get. Or, or you know when you, when you meet somebody and you, you, you're trying and you know they're hard to get. And, 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 and they, they, they're cutting style on you. And, and every, every move you try, they, they, they just not, that's us. Because this lover is loving with everything. And, and we are responding in, in, in these kind of measured halfway ways where we want to keep control. But by definition, brothers and sisters, love cannot have control. By definition, love gives everything to the other. By definition. And, and, and so 
our, our half-measured kinds of living and, and the reason why our life is so poorly and the reason why, why there's so much frustration and depression and, and so much anxiety and worry and so much stuff in the world that is negative is because we wouldn't just simply open our hearts and our lives to this trinity of love that wants to love us with everything. So here St. Matthew. The 11 disciples went up the mountain where they had arranged to meet him and they saw him. They fell down before him and Matthew says, but some hesitated. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you get it? Some hesitated, some doubted. Some didn't give themselves completely to him. As it was then, it is now. And Jesus spoke to them and he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Remember when in the second temptation, the, the devil said to him, you know, oh God, don't go through all this drama, you know. Just bow before me. And, and all these earths, are, this, this is mine. I will give all authority to you. Just bow before me. But Jesus doesn't do the cheap way. He doesn't do the easy way. What he does is the loving way. And, and, and the loving way is that what he, what he does is, is through the cross. And, and, and that's why in the deaf community, when you want to say the word Jesus, this is what they do. They point, they point to the nail holes in his hands. Be, because it is, it, is, it is through the cross that he demonstrates what real love is. And, and he gets his authority th through love. That all authority is given to him because he's, done the, he's gone the way of love. And because he's gone the extreme way of love, he has authority through love. His authority comes from love. And he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples. And, and this is the first criteria, the first call of, it, of his. You know, when, when you baptize your children, you said you will bring them up in the, in the faith, eh? And, and, and at the end of the, the, the teaching, we said, you are the first teachers of these children. May you be the best of teachers. And, and, and bring, making them disciples is bringing, to be a disciple is to bring your mind and your heart and submit to Christ. Bend my heart to your will, O oh God. It is to, to submit to the will of God. It, it is to live your life seeking the will of God in the little and the big things. It is to live your life seeking the will of God and submitting yourself to God's will in little and big things alike. Just as the Father gives everything to the Son and He has more than enough, so too we are called to give everything over to God and knowing that when we give everything to God, we will have more than enough. And that's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who gives everything over to God knowing that he will have more than enough. And, 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 and why will we have more than enough? Because what we give will be filled to overflowing. And, and what we give will be paltry in comparison to what gives, God gives back to us. So go into all the nations, make disciples of all the nations. So not only are we called to be disciples, we're called to be missionary disciples. Because the call is not just to become a disciple and be happy with it, but it's to do so in all the nations. That, that, that we aren't to hope that people become Christian. We are to be out there helping people to see the incredible love of God. If you opened your heart to this incredible love of God, brothers and sisters, and this, this, this love consumed you from inside and filled you from inside, we, we could not help but want to share that love with everyone else. And, and that's what Christianity is about in its essence. And when we make disciples, then we baptize them. And how do we baptize them? In a single name. It's not in the names, plural of. It is in the name of. A singular name. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because we are Trinitarian people. And from our baptism, we were baptized into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we understand our baptismal call, then we understand the Trinity. If we understand the Trinity, we understand mission. If we understand mission, we understand discipleship. If we understand discipleship, then we understand we hold nothing to ourselves, brothers and sisters, but everything we have, we give to him. Amen.